I, I, you're not supposed to excuse yourself before a talk, um, but I'm going to do it anyway because I like breaking convention. I actually uh, wrote something. I normally do these things off the cuff. But what I want to talk about is very important to me, and I want to make sure I speak very carefully because a lot of the times when I talk about or write about these topics, uh, I get misinterpreted, and I'm tired of it. And so I, uh, I've actually printed this out. So I apologize that I'm not actually going to be maintaining a lot of eye contact, which is fine because I can't really see you anyway. Um, but I will be looking down a lot, and I apologize for that, but there you go. Um, for those of you who are new, and, and for those of you who have been here for a while, uh, come to more than one TAM, I, t I typically talk about astronomy, space, and, and science, and, and, and the way they're twisted and distorted by anti-scientists, by, by pseudo-scientists. And I, for all the years that I've been doing active skepticism, I've never actually stood up here and talked about what it means to be an active skeptic, to do skepticism, about how we practice this art of ours. It's, it's not really necessarily a science skepticism. It, it can, there's some art to it. And I've not discussed skeptics ourselves. And so um, over the past couple of months, I've been thinking about this a lot. I read a lot of blogs. I read the bulletin boards and all of that. And honestly, there's been some alarming developments in the way skepticism is being done. And uh, you know, perhaps not overall, but in some specific places, the tone of what we're doing is decaying. And uh, instead of relying on the merits of the arguments, which is what critical thinking is really all about, what about evidence-based reasoning is about, uh, it seems that vitriol and venom are on the rise. And I'm unhappy about that, and I want to talk about it. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question here. Um, how many of you here today used to believe in something, used to, past tense, whether it was flying saucers, psychic powers, religion, anything like that? You can raise your hand if you want to. I mean, I, I, I imagine, yeah, um, not everybody's born a skeptic, right? A lot of you are raising your hand. I'd even say most of you from what I can, what I can tell. Now, let me ask you a second question. The second question is, how many of you no longer believe in those things and you became a skeptic? because somebody got in your face screaming and called you an idiot, brain damaged, and a retard. Okay? Yeah. Right. Um, one of the things that we like to say as skeptics, and a lot of our aphorisms are uh, correct in general but incorrect in detail, is that the plural of, da uh, the plural of anecdote is not data. Right? We ha if one anecdote is an anecdote. But you know what? You know what data is? It's a lot of anecdotes put together. And right now, there are 1,300 people in this audience. You're self-selected, mostly, as skeptics, overwhelmingly. That's not an anecdote, OK? That's data. You're self-selected as skeptics. And yet, very few of you raised your hands. And the ones who did, I think, on the second question were mostly joking about it. Um, I think this is important. And I think this is a, something I want you to keep in your, in your mind while I'm talking here. Skepticism is hard. Okay? Skepticism is in many ways a self-annihilating message. Okay? How do you convince someone they're not thinking clearly when they're not thinking clearly? Right? <laughs> and, and it's worse because as, as Michael Shermer uh, talked about this morning, and as most of us already know, our brain is not wired for skeptical thinking. It's wired for faith. And so um, what we're trying to say to people is, is difficult for them. And uh, studies have shown that people who lose their faith tend to replace it with something else, with a different type of belief. If you start off religious and you lose your, your faith in God, you'll replace that with something else, some other, some other non-evidence-based reasoning. An excellent example of this, and I'm sorry it's another anecdote, is Julia Sweeney. We all know her, I hope. And her, her brilliant, you know, and her brilliant uh, one-woman story, Letting Go of God. And now, you know, she, she started off a, a true believer and ended up a skeptic and a critical thinker. But um, that's, actually, that's actually a rare case. It doesn't happen like that. And I, I'll, I may mention her again later because I think her case is actually very important. It gets worse. Studies have actually shown that when you debunk a misconception, you actually wind up reinforcing it later. So when somebody comes in and says, I think that, I, I don't know, the full moon on the horizon is because of the atmospheric effects of acting like a lens. And you say, oh, no, 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 it's an illusion. It's this and this and this and this. And a year later, you say, what causes the moon illusion? And they'll say, you know, I heard it was an atmospheric effect. And so actually debunking 
reinforces the things we're trying to debunk. It's uh, irritating, actually. And uh, it, it puts a damper on trying to show people why they're wrong. And it, gets, it, gets, it just keeps getting worse. The message we're trying to convey is hard all by its lonesome. And it's even worse when we're trying to peddle this idea, when you think about what we're actually saying, of no magic, no afterlife, no higher moral authoritative father figure, no security, and no happy ever after. Okay? This is a tough sell. And it, it you know, <laughs> In, in many cases, people will prefer magic over science, and they will prefer fantasy over reality. Um, Santa Claus is more fun than getting presents from your parents, right? And the Tooth Fairy is more exciting than knowing that it's just your parents uh, putting money under your pillow. And I'm, I'm sorry, it's a spoiler alert there. Um, <laughs> now, look. For those of you who know me, and, and like Pamela, I'm a science evangelist. I do this because I have a passion for it. I know how amazing and how awesome black holes and supernovae and spiral galaxies are. And I know, as a scientist, or at least one who used to do science, I know about the imagination, the creativity, the sense of wonder, and the deep, profound beauty of, of science. I understand that and I know it. But not everybody else does. The generic person out there, someone not in our group, <sighs> They tend to hear the message that science is hard and that it's boring. And worse, skeptics and scientists, we tend to be thought of as being stuffy and stilted and a social, if not downright evil and sociopathic. You know, atheists eat babies, don't you know, right? So uh, it's, a, it's a tough sell. And, and also, how do believers think of themselves? Many times their self-identity is wrapped up in their belief. And one of the most important things people use to define themselves is their, for example, their religion or their belief. They might say, you know, I'm, I'm a UFO person or, or whatever. It doesn't matter what the belief is. Not only that, our society stresses faith. How many movies have as their final message something about faith? How many books and how many TV shows? The, 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 the doubt in the movie is downplayed. The person who is doubting is shown as ineffectual, even bad. And the belief is the highest ideal. I mean, come on, clap if you want Tinkerbell to live, right? So, <laughs> congratulations. Um, uh, uh, a Cottingley fairy is, is still alive because of you. Um, so with all of this stacked against us, and this is a lot of stuff stacked against us, why in the hell would you want to make it harder to deliver that message? The odds of us making any progress in society are very low, and it's borne out by the data. Religion is still a huge influencing factor in the world, and that's 200 plus years after the Enlightenment. That's a long time. More beliefs are waning, okay? Um, I, I, I have to admit, I wrote this speech several days ago, but I think this is quite funny. Um, what I wrote here is that many beliefs are, are waning. You don't hear much from moon hoax believers anymore. Um, <laughs> but a lot of them, but look, but they're out there, right? They're out there. Um, we are making progress, for example. Uh, in the UK, Simon Singh. Love that man, love his hair. Um, <laughs> You know, in, with chiropractic in the UK, we're making a lot of progress. But when you really think about it, they were the ones who shot themselves in the foot. They were the ones who sued Simon. Simon was just writing an article about them, and he was absolutely right, especially in his word choice. Um, but, but they shot themselves in the foot. We weren't even holding that gun. Okay, They were the ones that made fools of themselves and all the fallout of what happened after that. It, um, it, you know, on a brighter note, homeopathy may be diluting itself out of existence in the UK. <laughs> But in that case, okay, and, and in that case, it is doctors and skeptics who are fighting it. So that's good. We're, you know, we are making some progress. But you know what? Psychics are still out there bilking people out of money. Um, alternative medicine is still keeping people away from real medicine. The anti-vaxxers are just as strong as ever. They're getting more of a foothold. Even though Andrew Wakefield has been humiliated and shown to be wrong, he's, you know, he's writing books, he's touring the country, he's on TV all the time, and, bec and maybe because of this, but certainly in some regions, pertussis is on the rise, and polio is coming back. Polio is, is seen to be coming back. Now, I'm not trying to make a list of our failures. I'm not up here to, to, to bring doom and gloom to everybody here. And I'm not even trying to target our next campaigns. I'm not saying what we should be talking about. Um, I'm simply pointing out that this stuff is hard. It is an uphill battle. Yeah.